everybody. So I'd just like to say a few words about Peng, just to introduce him. Peng Gao is a senior researcher at Syracuse University in New York in the Geography and Environment Department. So he's a geographer and a physicist trained in fluvial geomorphology. His research focuses on geomorphological processes in uh, catchment areas, especially on sediment transport in catchment areas, in agricultural systems. He also uh, does modeling. He looks at hydrological processes and sediment transport and morphological structures uh, in mountain rivers. So since 2015, his research has been focused in different areas, dynamics and environmental changes and the impact of urban uh, development on geospatial areas. He, he's the guest speaker for HDO Lyon. He's been here since the beginning of March and he will stay through to mid-July with us, notably to work with the researchers at HDO Lyon, so with myself as well, on the themes re relating to braided rivers, especially the King Che Tibe Plateau. And with Peng, we're working on geospatial approaches. Uh, we're working with satellites to try and study the movements of braided rivers and their impacts and the impact of environmental changes on the Tibetan plateau. So I think I finished my introduction. Thank you very much, Peng, for being with us. We're now going to listen to you. Thank you, Barbara. And also, I want to thank everyone for joining us at this later time of a day. Uh, today, I'm going to uh, talk about braided rivers in the Qinghai Tibet Plateau. Uh, in my talk, I will cover this areas. First, I want to give you a brief introduction of uh, the spatial distribution of uh, the braided rivers uh, in the Qinghai Tibet Plateau. And then I will provide you some very detailed uh, uh, examples of braided river ridges uh, within the Qinghai Tibet Plateau. After that, I will use the three examples to introduce you the functional characteristics of these braided rivers. And this will be followed by my summaries and the projections of the future research. My talk will end by showing you some very interesting pictures of unique animals on the Qinghai Tibet Plateau. So please stay with me all the way to the end. Okay, so where is the Qinghai Tibet Plateau? Uh, the Qinghai Tibet Plateau is located on the west side of China, and uh, it has a mean elevation about 4,000 meters, so which is why this is the world's highest plateau. And uh, the entire area covers about 2.5 million square kilometer. However, it's a uh, Population density is very, uh, very sparse. It's only 44 persons per square kilometer because this is not a very good place uh, for people to live. So from the fluvial uh, perspective, in, inside of the uh, Qinghai Tibet Plateau, there are uh, all kinds of rivers distributed from north east side of the uh, Qinghai Tibet Plateau, all the way down to the south of the, of the plateau. So in general, these uh, rivers can be group, grouped into five watersheds. Uh, the first one is called uh, the Upper Yellow River. And this one actually connected to the Yellow River that passes through the northern part of the China. The second one is the Upper Yangtze River, and this one uh, is downstream part uh, cross uh, all the way uh, across the southern part of China. 
And the third one is the Upper Lantern River. When this river moves south, it becomes the Mekong River running through Laos, Thailand, Vietnam, and Cambodia. The fourth one is the Upper Nujiang River. And when it moves to the south, it becomes the Selwyn River. And this river passing through the Burma in the uh, south of Asia. And the last one is uh, the Yalu Zambu River. And this river, when it's run to the south in the downstream, it becomes uh, 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 Burma, Putra, Burma Putra River, which runs through the India. So next, uh, what I'm going to do is that I will introduce you some example British river systems within each of this uh, big uh, South area watershed. The first one is, uh, the, uh, is uh, the Upper Yellow River. Within this river, as you can see from this uh, uh, picture, there are, all, uh, there are British rivers distributed all over the places through the uh, watersheds. Most of them are concentrated on the upstream sections, even though you can see some of them are on the main channel sections and some of them are distributed in the tributaries. And next, I'm going to focus on two specific breeded branches. The first one is called the Da Heba River. It is a branch in the distributed in the so, uh, uh, in the downstream part of uh, the watershed. It's uh, joined directly to the mainstream of the Upper Yellow River. The second one is uh, in the upstream section of uh, the Upper Yellow River, and it's uh, the part of the main river. It is called the Daru Ridge. Now let's get into the first one, Da Heba River. And this picture shows you the topographic distribution of uh, the watershed that includes this uh, Da Heba River. What you can see here, uh, you, 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 you're not going to see clearly from this, but I will show you next. The, the characteristics, the physical characteristics of this river is that its valley is formed by the very strong erosion processes because of tectonic movement. And also the bridge rivers de developed within this valley are confined by the steep cliffs on both sides of uh, the river. And uh, because of that, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, materials supplied from these two cliffs uh, into the river. And uh, I will show you from, uh, uh, from here. And uh, this is the picture I show you in the kind of a confluent, confluent section point uh, be, uh, uh, between the two upstream uh, uh, rivers, as you can see from this uh, side, uh, you only see it from this picture, the mainstream, because this is a dry season. Uh, the uh, water discharge is not very high. However, if you look up here, you see on both sides of the cliffs, uh, they have a relatively, I mean, about the same elevation, which tells you this is the same terrace. And this braided river is actually caused by strong down cutting of the fluvial processes. Next, if we go further downstream along this river from this point to the, to the downstream section, this is what you can see. Again, the braided river is bounded by the two steep cliffs. And the most striking point I want to make in this picture is uh, this series of, of alluvial fans. And these alluvial fans are actually supplied a large amount of uh, sediment to the rivers. They really shape uh, shaped the bad material distributions of this river. And this is the picture taken from the downstream part of uh, this, uh, uh, this watershed. As you can see, some details of the particles uh, in the channels. Uh, and also you see the main Tri uh, uh, main channels of the braided system. And uh, 
This is at the confluence of this watershed and the river actually joins into the main river, main upper yellow river. And this part is actually the main upper yellow river. So basically the, the major characteristics of this watershed is this particle size and its distribution. And the, what I want to make, the point I want to make is that uh, the particle size that you see on the riverbed here are mainly comes from the, uh, the, uh, the two sides of the steep cliffs uh, caused by very active uh, here slope processes. And this shows you how active the channel, the braided river systems itself. As you can see, this bank protection uh, construction has, uh, has been uh, uh, undercut by very strong, very powerful flows uh, through its the main channel system. Next, uh, I want to focus on the second part of uh, the uh, re reach in this watershed, uh, the Daru Ridge. And this is a part of the main upstream main channel. The, the section I'm going to focus on is the right upstream of a local county called Da Ri, as you can see from this uh, uh, image. And the picture you see here is, is essentially a, 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 an oblique UAV picture. It shows you a quite different uh, Breeded river system compared against the, the breeded systems in Daru River, it is much more stable. And also, you see a lot of bars here so are covered by uh, vegetations here. So here, I shows you a close look of these bars with vegetation covered that has a, a relatively higher elevation. The bars with beer soils on top has a lower elevation. You can imagine during high flow, during high discharge, those beer soil bars will be inundated and also may be eroded by high flow rate. Okay, next uh, let's go to the second watershed, the upper Yenzi River watershed. In this watershed, I will focus on the upper part of the watershed and uh, talk about uh, different types of uh, breeded river systems. So overall, uh, the physical characteristics of this part is that most source areas of this uh, river systems uh, are bounded by glaciers, which is represented by this red color. It just uh, represents very high, uh, high uh, elevations. And also the alluvial valleys developed in this system are all, uh, 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 are all based on deposition processes uh, rather than erosion processes. Okay, so within this system, I want to start from this uh, very up, uh, very upstream wa sub watershed, which is called the uh, Buqiu River. And in this river, you can see its uh, topographic uh, distri distribution of the entire watershed. Watershed. I will start from very south area of this watershed, and to show you the picture of its south area, as you can see, it's covered by glaciers. The location where I stood to take this picture has the elevation of 5,250 meters. So this area is basically uh, above 6,000 or 6,500 meters. The striking uh, side is that uh, you see that clear, like the strong, like a uh, glacial melting processes, uh, the thick of glacier become thinner and um, many parts of uh, the hills, uh, the mountains uh, used to cover the by glaciers that uh, disappeared. So it shows you the strong impact of climate change on these areas. Okay, when we move from this south area downstream a little bit, as you can see from here, we begin to see the formation of the breeded system, but here it's still very small, not, not very uh, mature because the contributing area is uh, not big enough here. When we move further down, as you can see from here, 
from this uh, UAV picture, you can see the very well developed uh, breeded river system. It is in this area, as you can see, the valleys become so widening at this location. Okay, so in this uh, closer look view, you can see the, what the point bar looks like uh, in this system and uh, what, what kind of uh, the river banks uh, uh, of this breeded river system look like here. As we move further down, as you can see, the valleys becomes wide open. As a result, you can see the breeded rivers developed very well, and there are really multiple uh, channel branches developed in this very flat, wide uh, valleys. And you see like a, a, a bars covered by green uh, vegetation. Also, there are some uh, bars with beer soils. You can imagine during high flows, those bars are subject to strong fluvial processes. And this is a closer view of this section of breeded river. As I said just now, you can see this beer soil bars has already experienced some, uh, some erosion. When flow rate increases and more erosion would occur, uh, along the side of these bars. Next, I will go to the other side of this area, which is called the Tortua River. And this is the opposite. And this is the Buchu side. I'm going to the opposite side of, of Buchu River, which is a Tortua River. From this topographic picture, you can see the valley where I, uh, where, where this point showing you is uh, generally wider. And because of that, you, when you look at this amazing picture, I mean, you can see how complicated the breeded river system is here. I cannot even count how many branches in this system. So this is a really very, very complex uh, uh, breeded river system. And here I show you some closer view. As you can see, these are the, uh, uh, the bars with beer soil. And as, uh, as I said just now, these bars are subject to strong fluvial processes, mainly erosion, but sometimes the deposition also happens along these bars, all on top of these bars. Next, let's go to another part of this watershed, and a sub-watershed called the Chumar River. And this is its topographic distribution. And you can see like there are two tributaries joined together uh, to merge into one the main stream here. And the, the location I will picture, I will show you is somewhere here. So the sediment in this part position comes from this right, uh, right branch of the river. The most striking uh, feature you can see from this uh, part of uh, Brady River is uh, its color, its red color, right? It's quite different from what I showed you just now within the same watershed. And the reason is because this sediment comes from the upstream uh, source areas uh, where the deposited sediment has this uh, uh, red color. And the red color is mainly caused by very rich concentration uh, of iron element. Okay, and which is why this river, local people also call it as a red water, uh, water a red, a red water river, sorry. Okay, so now I was here just now, the Chuma River. Now I move from here downstream to the mainstream section, we call the Tongtian River here. Okay, in this one, I use this Google Earth map to show you this plain form structure of this river ridge section. Here, I show you uh, the UAV oblique uh, picture. Basically, what you can see here is that uh, this is a braided river that is uh, partially confined by the mountains on one side of the river. Indeed, this side of river is, uh, is actually very, uh, uh, very deep here, but it's confined by this mountain. But on the other side of the river, there's still enough space for the river to develop, to grow. 
Okay, from this closer look view, a uh, closer look view, you can see again the instability of this. Uh, bars without uh, vegetation covered. And that you can imagine a year later, if you come to the same location, you are not going to the see, to see the same uh, sediment bars appeared here. Okay, so in general, within this uh, upstream yellow against the river watersheds, uh, you, you can see, we can uh, uh, Summarize its uh, physical characteristics. Uh, first, uh, the particles, uh, the bad materials, uh, is uh, actually formed by the mix of sand and uh, gravels. Uh, it's mainly from uh, based on its upstream area or its bank materials. Second, the land cover is very uh, sparse. So the percentage of land cover, vegetation cover is very, very low. Even though like in this picture, it appears like uh, there are a lot of vegetation covers on this area. And this is just uh, in the very downstream area. As I showed you just now, in many upstream channels, uh, there are not many vegetation cover. And next is, uh, this breeded river systems are almost has no human disturbances as, as, as such. They are almost like pristine watersheds. The last one, they all have the glacier as their source areas. So they are affected by glacier melting. melting. Okay, the next one is the upper Lanzang River. And in this river, I will only focus on the middle part of the river. And this is the picture I want to show you about the breeded river system. And you can see from here clearly, there are more vegetation covers here and more sand, uh, uh, point bars are covered with the rich vegetation. And this shows you the close view pictures uh, during the wet season, and you can see the density of vegetation on the point bars. Uh, this shows you the picture of the dry season. You can see many uh, branches are dried out during the dry seasons. So this just shows you how dynamic these breeded river systems. Next, uh, I show you the upper Nujiang River. Okay, in this river, uh, because it's not easy to reach this river, we don't, we didn't, we haven't spent a lot of time on this river. So I just show you one picture in the upstream section of the, this river, which also shows a, a breeded uh, morphological structure uh, in this uh, uh, watershed. The last one is the upper uh, Yalu Zambu River, and it, it is loca located the very south of uh, the area. Within this river, you can see breeded river also developed uh, across the entire watershed from upstream to the downstream. And I will only focus on the two areas to show you. First is uh, one of the main tributary of the Yalu Zambu River, which is called the Lhasa River. The second is uh, its middle ridge section of the river. Okay, so this one shows you the Lhasa River, the main tributary, it's during the dry season. And the key point I want to show you is that you can see like the impact of this road built by human beings on the river systems. And also from these pictures, you can see First, this bridge across the entire river valley. And the second, you see this very regularized, uh, regularly arranged vegetations, which are man-made, uh, no, this uh, which are artificial, artificially planted trees on the beer soil bars for the purpose of stabilizing these bars. So the point is that this river system is uh, significantly affected by human activities. And this shows you the middle reach of y Yajiang River. Again, the strike, the most striking point is this uh, regularly distributed trees uh, planted by human beings uh, for the purpose of uh, stabilize the point of bars. Again, you can see from this uh, closer look uh, uh, pictures of these uh, human uh, uh, man-made trees on the point of bars. Okay, next. I want to switch to the 
Next topic about uh, the river function, uh, functioning characteristics, uh, I will introduce you the three examples uh, uh, of what we have done so far. The first one is in the upper Yans River watersheds. Uh, and uh, in this study, we selected the two next, next watershed. The first one is this smaller sub watershed, and the second one is uh, this. Uh, Big one. And uh, within this two watershed along the main channel, we selected a, a bridge, uh, a braided ridge from upstream, middle, middle part, and the downstream, uh, respectively, in this two watershed and studied their morphological changes. And from this diagram, you can see the top three are the results from the small uh, sub water shares. Uh, this is upstream, middle stream, and the downstream. The bottom three is, three is from the larger water shares. Uh, so what you can see clearly is that uh, there are some general patterns here. Okay, before I get into that, I want to explain to you the meaning of the horizontal. And this is the ratio of water area with regards to the entire valley area. So from moving from left to the right, the ratio becomes a higher, which also means the water discharge in the braided river systems increasing. So all of these diagrams shows one common feature, that is their breeding intensity, which is BIT on the vertical size, reaches the maximum value when uh, about 40% of the valleys is covered by water. Okay, and this, uh, uh, this pattern uh, exists regardless of, regardless of spatial distribution of the rivers. Next, let's look at the sediment processes. And uh, this diagram shows you the uh, suspending the sediment load against uh, the discharge, which we commonly call it as a sediment reading curve. This is for the small watershed. This is for the larger watershed. This is the comparison of both watershed. So what you can see from here is that actually the two watersheds has a very similar sediment reading curves. So that means that the sediment transport processes are very similar in this uh, uh, two uh, sub watershed, even though the smaller watershed is closer, much closer to the glacier uh, source areas. So that means that suggests that the glacier melting processes hasn't been significantly impact affect the sediment transport processes. In summary, this study shows that overall the morphological structure of these braided rivers has remained stable over decades, uh, regardless of their location, spatial locations. In the second example, I want to show you our uh, study on the, uh, in the Lhasa River, the main tributary to the Yaluzambu River watershed. And in this one, we focus on the downstream part of the river. Above this river, upstream of the river, there are two dams uh, constructed. This downstream dam, uh, dam constructed in 2006, uh, the upstream one was constructed in 2013. Because of that, uh, we collected the data in three time periods uh, before 2006 uh, and between 2006 and 2016 and after uh, 2013. Okay, we also divided this study area into four ridges based on the dominant uh, human activities. And the first one uh, is a, a ridge A is the closest to the, the, uh, the, the downstream dam and ridge D is close to the ridge, the confluence point. This table basically just shows you different types of uh, human activities, uh, including farmland, afforestation, urban development, and mining. Okay, and on top of that is uh, the impact of the two dams uh, constructed on, uh, upstream of that. So I only, I only want to focus on part of the results which are showed, uh, uh, marked by this yellow circle. And this uh, 
these points represent the temporal changes of uh, active channel weights and breeding intens intensity of reach A through the three periods. The, the idea of this is that it shows that either uh, what you can see is that from the early stage to the later stage, the both uh, uh, channel width and intensity, breeding intensity, slightly decreased, but the, this decrease is not statistically significant. So the interpretation could be first, that means this breeding reach has a very fast response to the dam construction because the dam was constructed here in this period and in this period. Or the interpretation could be that the morphological change of this ridge is not affected by the dam construction, rather it affected by farmland because the ridge A has the highest percentage of farmland. Our hydrological analysis actually confirms this second interpretation. Next, I want to again just to show you the example, the ridge C. As you can see, uh, with regards to urban development, the ridge C has the highest percentage of urban development. So he's, uh, the, the channel widths actually are generally high, do not align with uh, the channel width of other uh, ridges. And, uh, but the breed in intensity actually fall in line with uh, uh, you know, the trend of other uh, ridges with regards to the percentage of urban area. And uh, for the farmlands, uh, you see some opposite situation. The breeding intensity actually does not follow the trend, but the uh, channel weights uh, actually follow this trend of the change. The point I want to make here is that uh, actually the response of breeding morphology to the different types of human activities uh, are very complex. We really need more information to separate the impact of different types of human activities to the river morphologies. And this is an ongoing research we are doing right now. Okay, so the third example would be uh, uh, the, aid, the study we did in the upper Lansang River watersheds. And, uh, and in this watershed, we focus on the middle section of this watershed. Uh, and the breed, uh, this is a, a typical breeded river system. We divided the breeding channel, the breeded channels into two types, uh, flowing channels in blue. It represents uh, the wider, larger channels that has uh, always have the water flowing through it, flowing through them. And uh, the second one is non-fluent channels, which are those uh, uh, disconnected channels or isolated channels in red. And they, all, they, they typically occur during dry season, representing the degree of uh, connection between uh, groundwater and the surface water. And these five uh, images shows you the UAV data of the same area because of their high spatial resolution, we use the measurement from these five UAV uh, images to calibrate our measurement in the, uh, from the Landsat data for this area. Okay, so in this diagram, you see that the breeding intensity in this area actually closely related to the discharge. Uh, here, you see the temporal trend of breeding intensity over time, and also the associated peak discharges, which are in yellow, and the number of days uh, the discharges uh, is above a given threshold value, which shows in this triangular. We also, you can see in this one, we compare the uh, active channel width and breeding intensity against those of uh, breeded rivers in European air, uh, air, uh, alpines. And you can see in general, uh, both the 
weight and the breeding intensity are high in our uh, study area. So we concluded first that breeding intensity was mostly controlled by flows, but in some periods it was not. And the first part is mainly from uh, based on this result. The second part comes from this period, from 2008 to the 2010. You can see the peak discharge actually decreases. You would expect that the decrease of a peak discharge would cause deposition of sediment, which will cause the decrease of breeding intensity. But if you look at the breeding intensity in this period, they are increasing. This basically shows you complexity of morphological adjustment to the variable hydrological processes. The second conclusion, we say that uh, uh, breeded ridge is potentially well connected uh, breeded system with the sufficient sediment supply. We argue that this is uh, mainly because uh, the less uh, vegetation cover and the lower surface uh, roughness because we calculated the surface roughness of our study area and then compared against those in the European Alpines and our values are very, uh, is very low. And uh, uh, further, uh, furthermore, we showed that uh, during the dry season, which is a spring and fall, these two periods, uh, the non-flow channels uh, covers up to 30% of the breeding systems. Uh, this percentage is much higher than that uh, in the typical European uh, uh, alpine breeded river systems. And uh, when we look at the temporal changes of uh, vegetation areas, uh, as you can see, in the most time of uh, past few decades, uh, the vegetation uh, uh, area is very, very low, less than 0.3 square, square kilometer. But after 2010, it started to increase and maintains the high value. The first part could be explained by the morphological uh, dynamics of the uh, rivers, but the second part cannot. So we further shows that actually the temperature of vegetation grew in season, which is typically summer, actually increased with over time. So we think this increasing of temperature could in, in, uh, explain the sudden increase of vegetation after 2010, even though the uh, uh, the early part of the period, uh, the low vegetation was controlled by very dynamic uh, uh, morphological changes of the river. Okay, so in summary, uh, breeded rivers are very well dis uh, uh, distributed in the uh, Qinghai Tibet Plateau. It is very important to understand their morphodynamic processes uh, because uh, understanding this uh, would help us uh, to understand how in the future these rivers and uh, associated ecosystems uh, would adapt to the climate change and uh, the in, uh, enhanced human disturbances. Second, the breeded rivers uh, seem less affected by climate change and uh, human disturbances. Uh, and uh, we definitely need more research and need more data to confirm this uh, conclusion. The third, uh, the river functioning uh, of this uh, uh, breeded rivers is apparently featured by the well connected, uh, be, uh, well connection between ground and surface flow through the favorable morphological structures uh, such as uh, non-flowing channels. With this, uh, okay, so the point here is that if this is uh, true, then the question is, uh, uh, does this mean that the ecosystem of these breeded systems will be improved in the future? So with this in mind, I have this general hypothesis that is climate change in the future will improve the ecosystem conditions of these breeded systems with more vegetation growing on bars and along the banks. If this is true, then the uh, the breeded river systems on the Qinghai Pl Tibet Plateau will become one of very few cases that shows the positive impact of climate change. 
Okay, I want to use this recently uh, published review paper on the water balance in the um, in the Qinghai Tibet Plateau to give you my reasons for this hypothesis. The blue area you see is called the Indoric Basin, means all the water falling within the basin will stay within the uh, uh, the basin. The pink area is called the Extoric basin means all the water falling within the, uh, the, the area will flow out of this. If you look at the boundary of these two basins, you can see clearly by comparing with the boundary of the five source area watersheds I described to you just now, they are exactly the same. So basically, that means this lower part is our uh, braided river, is our river systems in. The, uh, on the, in the Qinghai Tibet Plateau. So the, the past study shows that uh, actually the increase of water storage in this area is much higher than the increase of water storage in this area. And then my interpretation for that is because of the percentage of uh, uh, glacier area cover in this uh, lower area, water, uh, watershed systems uh, is much lower than those uh, in this uh, uh, indo rig basins. And because of that, I, I uh, hypothesize that in the future, the increase of uh, water discharge will be limited. This limited increase of water discharge where uh, is not going to be enough to cause uh, uh, more sediment transport uh, uh, that carries the sediment left in the source, source area due to a uh, glacier re uh, retreat. Second, the increase of discharge will increase the base flow of the discharge in these water systems, which means it will enhance the interaction between groundwater and surface water, and which will further encourage the development of a diverse uh, ecosystem. Okay, so. Uh, as you can imagine, in that remotely located area, it's even very hard to access access to these areas. If you work in that area, it's even harder because of the very high elevation and the uh, very harsh uh, weather conditions. However, every time when we arrive at that area, when we do our field work, we always find some fun. Uh, fun stuff. So before I end my talk, I will show you some fun pictures. And this is a Tibetan yaks. And in this picture, these two yaks are fighting with each other, but in, uh, in an amazing civilized way. So they basically just push uh, each other back and forth. If this guy wins, then they move this direction. If this guy wins, they move to the other di direction. So in the periods of about five minutes when we watch them, these guys basically just move back and forth, back and forth. Very interesting uh, picture. And this is uh, a Tibetan donkeys. And these donkeys actually stick their mouths into the uh, uh, the snow and the try to find the food. And remember, this is the snow happened in July, in the middle of the summer. And this is a Tibetan uh, uh, antelopes. This is a very symbolic animal in that area. What you see in this picture is are the four um, uh, young antelopes and their parents are staying around that like 60 or 100 meters away from them, watching them from distance. This is a Tibetan camera. It's kind of ugly. <laughs> and this is a Tibetan fox. And this guy is actually very sensitive to uh, human beings. It's not very easy to capture them. And this is a very scary Tibetan wolf. Okay, I took this picture from cars because I did not get out of the car. And we run into this wolf in the so-called no man zone that extends several hundred kilometers in the upper Yenzi River watershed. And this guy is a Tibetan uh, vulture. This is a very viciously bird. 
the vulture, Tibetan vulture is very famous. It's mainly because of this very unique Tibetan tradition, which is called a celestial, a celestial uh, a funeral or sky berry. So when uh, Tibetan people uh, uh, have a family members die, instead of burn the body or put the corpse into the coffin and bury them on the ground, they actually have their, their members body carried to the platform on top of the mountain. And then they will burn a, a, a smoke to call the vultures to come. And these vultures will eat up the body, they call the decomposition. And they believe that by doing that, their family members after their death will go to heaven. Okay, I stop here for my talk. Thanks for your attention. I'm, I'm happy to answer your questions. Merci beaucoup, uh, Peng. C'était uh... C'était riche, euh, plein d'images, plein d'informations. Merci. Thank you, Tang. That was very rich. You allowed us to travel. Alors, je pense, Baptiste, il veut savoir euh, le rôle. I think he wants to know the role of permafrost. Oh, OK. I, I get it. The, oh, what, ouais. what is the role of a permafrost, right? Uh, I... To be frank, I don't see the significant role of permafrost in the uh, bridged rivers I showed you, but uh, it doesn't mean they don't exist. The role of permafrost definitely has a role, but in the further upstream part of the river, that uh, it's very hard for us to reach that area because there's no road and the, and the elevations is further higher. So it's harder to reach that areas. I have an observation because listening to you, it seems that we can observe a kind of gradient from the north to the south. So there's more and more impact. Is, is that the case? Uh, and I, I thought as well that there are places where there isn't much human activity but you know we've seen some roads as well tell us a bit more about the human activity maybe okay thank you very good question uh here's my answer the human activity is mainly focused on this uh, the fifth uh, watershed called the uh, yalu zambu rivers if there's a uh, uh, there's all kinds of human activities happening right now. It's going to be intensified in the next five to 10 years. Human activities also is very active. No, I should say relatively active in the first very north part, it's called the Yellow River. And these are, these are uh, uh, for the different reasons, because in this uh, very up area, the, elevation is relatively low. There are part of this area, which is called the Zoiga Basin, which is here. The uh, actually weathers are very uh, like, a, uh, there are plenty of vegetation and the veg uh, uh, of plenty of, uh, uh, the precipitation rate is relatively high. There are pl plenty of vegetation, peatland and the wetland developed in that area, which is why there tend to be more people living in this area compared to in other area. And in these three areas, uh, there is a really relatively uh, uh, less people living in these areas, uh, and which is why there are less uh, human disturbance in the middle part of this uh, entire river system. Merci, Peng. Thank you, Peng. Um, Hervé is asking a question. He wants to know more about vegetation, planting, cultivation of forests. <laughs> Are you seeing this everywhere on the plateau? And um, when did it begin? Okay, so I, I, I don't think I have the exact number of years to to tell to answer this one, but I think the. The planting already started about uh, two decades ago, 
And uh, I believe we have some data to show that, uh, but I don't have this in front of me. I can get that data to show you. But I think what Avi asked is uh, the plantation in the very source watershed it's called the uh, Yalu Zambu watershed. It's, uh, it's this last uh, watershed uh, here. And uh, uh, this, uh, this is a very typical human activities uh, happened within this watershed, uh, Yalu Zambu water, uh, watershed. And in other watersheds, uh, we don't see this kind of uh, uh, plantation activities happens. Even though like uh, in the very north part of the uh, Ye uh, uh, Yellow River watersheds, uh, we see more vegetation cover. It's a natural vegetation cover in the braided systems, in particular, the upstream part of the, 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 the watershed, as I show you, showed you just now in the Daji River system here, in the upstream section of the river. There are more vegetations grew up here, but it's a natural vegetation. It's not a man-made uh, vegetation. I have another question. Uh, par exemple, uh, le premier exemple sur the le first example that you gave us sur le Yangtze, the, uh, on the Yangtze River, mm -hmm. you said that uh, the glacial melt didn't really have an impact on morphology. Has it had an impact on morphogenous floods? Have you tried to see whether that has uh, gradually increased the flow rate and, and therefore on morphogenous floods? I don't know whether my question is clear. Yeah, I understand uh, uh, the point. Okay, here's my answer. Uh, we did uh, uh, plot the annual, like, uh, and you mean discharge and the daily discharge against the time for the past three decades, more than three decades, uh, there is a very gentle in increase of uh, daily discharge, uh, which indicates that uh, the impact of a glacier on the discharge is not uh, very high. When I say not very significant, I mean it doesn't change the flow regime, which means uh, uh, it changes from a sluggish hydrograph into the flashy hydrograph. If that happens, what we should see is more sediment being transported through the system. Why? Because when a glacier melting happens, it will leave a lot of sediment in the source area as a sediment supply. So if it also changes the hydrological uh, regime, then you would expect more sediment being transported through the system. If that is the case, then you are not going to see this uh, almost uh, the same identical sediment rating curves. And that is the evidence I used to make that uh, statement. But uh, of course, uh, I, 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 I agree that we need more study to confirm this point. Just uh, uh, using this study is not, good, is not enough, which is why I provided my general hypothesis. Here's a more general question for you, Peng. And then we can continue to talk in the office if necessary. <laughs> You talked about the increase in temperature and better ecological conditions. But are they really better ecological conditions generally when these braided rivers are going to be lost? And that would be a shame, won't it? Do you see what I mean? Uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, can you repeat the last part you said? Uh, uh, what do you mean the, the, the uh, you're saying that there will be better ecosystem conditions thanks to the increase in temperature there will be more vegetation there will be more connectivity uh, with the underground with the groundwater but doesn't that mean that we will be losing the braided systems we will be losing the braided systems because of this and that's a shame no uh, uh, okay, I think here's the misunderstanding. Uh, 
the increase of uh, uh, hydrological processes, specifically water discharge, is caused mainly caused by the uh, glacial melting. Right, but there's another factor that I didn't mention because I don't have. I'm running out of time. That is a slightly increased precipitation. Okay, so this precipitation, the increase of precipitation, will continue. It will not stop, which means that the British River system will not disappear because of the glacier melting. I, I think that's probably something I need to clarify here. So the, the, there will be continuous, continuous water supply to this uh, uh, river systems here. And uh, the main reason, as I can expect in the future, let's, let's say five to 10 years, uh, the role of glacier melting becomes less and less. The role of increased precipitation on the hydrological processes of braided river becomes more and more. But there's a complete a complexity that is uh, the impact, the increase of uh, uh, precipitation is a highly, uh, is especially variable. So we needed to study this special variability. <laughs>